Hello and welcome to another episode of the Motor Magazine Performance Car Podcast. I'm Scott Newman and those of you watching on video will probably recognise today's guest. We've got John Bow with us. Hello John. Hello Scotty, how are you? I'm very well, I hope you're well too. So for those of you, you know the one or two of you out there that may not know who John Bow is, this <laughs> is John Bow's CV, just the very top level highlights. Australian Drivers' Champion 1984-1985, Australian Sports Car Champion 1986, Australian Touring Car Champion 1995, Bathurst 1000 winner 1989 and 1994 with a further five podiums, Sandown 500 winner 94 and 95, Bathurst 12 hour winner 2010-2014 and five times Touring Car Masters Champion. So he's pretty good at this driving thing. <laughs> Just it goes to show, I think, what uh, longevity does for you. you know, well, you... Dr- funny you should say that. <laughs> Driver database, driverdb.com, lists JB as the most successful Australian racing car driver by a country mile. He's got 231 race wins. Brooke Tattnall is second on 156. And that's only the data from 1978. So I raced before 1978 yeah, quite exactly. a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's not complete. Wow. They're, they're doing you a disservice. Uh, this, yes. <laughs> you have to be I'll, on the phone. I'll have to send an email. <laughs> send an angry word at email. Angry word, yeah. I mean, uh, um, I, I truly, I mean, I, I've heard that stuff because my friend Hamo in Sydney, you know, tells me that, but it's not, you know, what pushes my buttons, really. I, I always try and look towards tomorrow. That's just an old yep. cliche thing, but... I, you don't sit at home with a glass of red thinking. No, no. Yeah. Well, I sit at home with a glass of red sometimes, yeah. but but, but <laughs> I don't. About I don't think about the past. I think <laughs> about the future. You know, tomorrow I'm still quite active in racing. I, I like racing. I, in fact, I love racing, and I'm fortunate in, in as much as I'm supported by quite a number of people still that I've had association with for a long time, mm-hmm. such as Wilson and. Pace Consolidated and a lot of these names down my shirt here, if I can get it in the shot. Yep, there you, you go. Know. So, um, that's important. Yeah, it's it is. Keep you racing. It is, exactly. And that's why I do it, because yep. I, so I can keep racing. So I think I'm, I'm lucky in, this, in the sense that I landed in the Touring Car Masters when it was sort of in its infancy, and it's become quite popular with the public. I'm not sure it's as popular with the promoters, but it's, you know, the, the public... Uh, associate with cars of the 70s and 80s or 60s and 70s particularly and these cars are fast and noisy and wayward so you know I think that's helped me sustain if, yep. if, if that's the word yeah so uh, yeah I'm, I'm very well, fortunate we'll, we'll get to that we'll go sort of roughly chronologically through your career a little bit um, for some of the some people may be disappointed, but we're not going to focus a lot on your touring car stuff because you've talked about that forever. Like, yeah, yeah, you sure. know, you've talked about about supercars and Bathurst and all that. Let's talk about some of the. Let's try and teach some people some new things about JV and some <laughs> different topics. <laughs> they so may not want to know. They might not. Want, <laughs> we're going to get juicy. Um, it was interesting that you're primarily known as a touring car driver. You know, that's where your career, I guess, highlights came from. But initially, you were definitely a single seater man. Absolutely. You came out of Formula V, Formula Ford, and then went into F5000. <clears throat> so yes, I mean, I, I I grew up in an open wheel style family. My dad raced open wheelers in, in Tasmania. Like Tasmania then was relatively remote. It had its own little racing scene. There's two, two racetracks down there, uh, which is, you know, the same as Victoria has. Uh, so all my life, I wanted to race single seater. So I raced a Formula V. You know, when I first started, which was when I was about 15, which my dad and I went halves in. It was an Elfin, so we sort of formed an association with Elfin, and, and we had each car I subsequently had uh, was an Elfin. So I had, a, a, you know, an Elfin Formula 4, then I had an Elfin Formula 3 with a little Corolla engine in it, which was, the category was 1300cc. Um, and then I had an Elfin 700, which had a Ford engine, and so on and so on, and then we had a, a really good relationship with Gary Cooper, the late Gary Cooper, who was Elfin, and he gave me an opportunity to race outside Tassie. So for, for that fact, I'll be forever indebted to him. He, um, I guess he saw something in me and he, and he, he gave me a chance well, to race on, on the mainland, as we, we Tasmanians <laughs> call it. Overseas. Overseas, yeah. We're and both proud uh, Tasmanians. So. <laughs> we are. We, we are. We're, we're related. Escaped. We're related. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, I mean, 
a few things in your life made a difference, and that yeah. made a difference. Yeah. I, I got it was to like race. A pivotal moment, yes, it was a pivotal moment. Uh, another one was when I met Mark Pitch, who was running the Volvo team at the time in 1985. And another one was was you know getting to drive for Dick Johnson as as his team came on to a good strong performance period. You know, so so they have pivotal moments, and without any of those things. You know, I wouldn't be sitting here in this beautiful BMW talking to you. That's right. Um, a quick word about the car. For, it's the, the car's not the point of today, but we're actually in a BMW M760 IL, which is a, quite a pretty pretty flash wow. pretty gear. Yeah, We've got a 6.6 litre twin turbo V12 under the bonnet. Uh, it's exceptionally good for podcasting because it's very quiet and it's, it's very beautiful. comfortable. It's beautiful. So. It's, it's a lovely, lovely car. I, I wonder about cars. I mean, I love big cars, truly I do, but I, I wonder about the significance of them nowadays but <laughs> just the same it's you know you drive along it's quiet it's like being in an aeroplane really that's I'm, right absolutely. I'm sure um, single seaters was that because you followed Formula 1 at the time or that was just the scene that you got into I mean, was... uh, yeah I mean I, I followed Formula 1 I mean I grew up in a, a, a motor racing family I mean well, that's all we ever talked about motor racing um, my dad had you know sort of home built specials there was always a, a, a racing car in the garage. Um, you know, it was just a normal little family, but that was our focus. He was, my dad was very good friends with John McCormick, who, who at the time was, you know, one of Australia's best drivers. And so it just just evolved, it happened. I, I did, there was no, you know, great plan or no desire to do anything other than, you know, race. I mean, yeah. when you got to be old enough to get a license to race you know you, you just race so so now I mean nowadays youngsters look up with their eyes to be the next Lewis Hamilton there wasn't necessarily that no. you just you know this is good this is fun let's keep doing it yeah, yeah basically yes and and I mean it's not that I followed Formula 1 very very closely through motorsport magazine mostly and then later a little bit later when I was in my late teens through autosport I mean I when I left Tasmania I, I would have thrown out you know, 10,000 auto sports, I yep. reckon, which really hurt. <laughs> yeah. You know, I hate throwing magazines away. But um, that's, you know, at the time, say, Tim Schenken was driving in Formula One, um, and he was an Aussie guy, and, you know, I was quite interested in his racing life. And prior to that, of course, we had Sir Jack Brabham, and then later on, Alan Jones. So we always had someone to, to look up to. Someone who isn't very named very much, Vern Schuppen as well. Vern Schuppen, yes. I, I got to know Vern Schuppen, who's a lovely bloke. Um, when I first drove uh, for Elfin, and so you got to, if you take yourself back to 1978, Gary asked me to go over to Adelaide and, and do a test in the Formula 5000. So I'd driven a 130 brake horsepower Formula 3 car, so I went from that and I had a test in a 500 horsepower <laughs> Chevrolet powered monster. So it was, you know, it's pretty eye-opening experience. When you're, when you're doing that, I mean, you know, a car is a car to a certain extent. They do the same things, just at different levels. But yes. I mean, if you're fast in a Formula Three, you know what you're doing. So, but does it take a while to get you? Does it, you know, do, is it two laps and you're on it, or do you oh, have to build no, up over a day? No, you got, it's well, a you build up. I mean, it was no expectation. We'd. Uh, I'd sold my little Formula 3 car, my uh, and, and Gary had, you know, talked us into, as my dad and I, into uh, building a new car for the Australian Formula 2, which was going to be a single camshaft 1600 category. So there were a lot of interest, there was a lot of interest in that period. Different engines, Ford, VW Golf, uh, Brian Sampson developed the Toyota Sleeker engine, so there was quite a lot of lot going on. So while we were waiting for the car, he said, come over and have a drive in the 5000, not that you can actually race it or anything, yep. it was just, you know, go and have a drive in it. So I drove it at AIR, which is no longer it exists, but it doesn't get used, and um, we, you know, I obviously, I, I was quite careful, you know, I'm not a gung-ho kind of person until I feel it's time to be gung-ho, and, uh, but I must have impressed him because uh, in 1979, he, he asked me to drive it in, a, in a, a race, so, and then I subsequently drove it for a couple of years, so I can't remember, like, details of lap times and stuff, but yeah. I must have driven it quite well, and, and in that period of time, I met Vern Schuppen, who was driving, so, in time frame-wise, 
the 79 Rossman series, which was the, the culmination of the Tasman series, finished in uh, January, and then I drove that same car that Bernd Chupin drove in the Australian Grand Prix in Western Australia, mm-hmm. at, at Barbagallo as it's called now. So I was a, quite a rookie and, and Larry Perkins had just won the Rotham Series. So I was his teammate. So, you know, a, a greenhorn teammate in, in, in that, uh, at that level of racing anyway. So, and in the race, I was actually running second, and I, I, I reckon I could have won it, but it kept popping out of gear, and I had to drive one hand and hold it into gear, so... It's interesting that you've, um, a car you drive occasionally now, the March F1 car, yeah, is yeah. sort of a contemporary of that. How, do the, how does the sort of late 70s F1 car compare and differ to a late 70s F5000 car? Well, the, the first of all, you've got to go back you know, a thousand races to remember what the five thousand yeah, felt yeah, like. So, yeah. so my, you know, my memory of that car is not crystal clear. Cr- well, no, and and also I, you know, I was new to it. I was, I was, uh, in terms of technical expertise, as in car setup and things like that. I've, I've learned as I've gone along. But those, in that particular time, I, you know, I just got in the car and drove it. And, yeah. and Gary would ask me, you know what's it feel like and I'd try and explain to it so I wasn't <laughs> it <was good. laughs> but yeah so I ended up second in the Australian Grand Prix which was you know like quite a shock I think a shock to other people more than it was a shock to me but anyway uh, I um, the, the as you asked about the March the March is a is a, a, a better car to drive it's a lovelier car to drive because it's weight distribution's better yeah. like a, a Formula 5000 back in those days had the one I drove anyway had iron heads on it. It was very tail heavy. Was it kind so, of like the muscle car of a four yeah, single was. seater? Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah. That's why people are now talking about trying to get something going again that, that echoes Formula Five Thousand. But the little March, I love driving that. Now, you know, at my age, I I'm sure I don't drive like I did when I was 22 years old. So, uh, but I still love the March. It's it's a it's a beautiful, well balanced little car. But in historic terms, a March. With a Cosworth DV in it, has has got you know 450, 460 horsepower. Mm-hmm. A 5000 of the period had 500 horsepower, but a 5000 of now has 600 horsepower. Yeah. So you probably know, quite a lot more torque. And a way, way, way more yeah. torque. But but it, in in simple terms, which is the nicest car to drive? The Formula One yeah. car is the yeah. nicest car to drive because it's very sweet, well balanced. As an aside, there's a great video of JB ch- at Phillip Island recently chasing. The 85, 85 Turbo uh, Ferrari. Yeah, Alberetto Ferrari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look it up because it's an awesome little video. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just the, the sound of that Cosworth engine is, you know, enough to yeah. for the price of admission. But in terms of on a on a power circuit, a well-driven 5000 would beat that car now yeah. without any real drama. But mainly because of the power. Well, then you obviously started to make a name for yourself in touring cars. Went in the race of champions. Uh, sort of won that. 1980 against all sorts of famous people. Yeah, I thought that was going to be a defining moment, but it wasn't. No. It was quite, you know, because when you're young and you, you know, particularly probably if you live in Tassie, you're a little remote from everything. And you, I thought, you know, I've, I've won this race of champions, which was, for anyone that doesn't know about it, it was a, a identical VC HDT. So it was sort of used to launch the the Brock brand in in road cars. And they were terrific cars, like really. Good cars. Those those Brock cars were were you know a step ahead of everything else in Australia at that stage. So, but I thought this is going to make a difference. I'm going to get you know. Speak Brabham, Alan yeah. Jones. Uh, who else was there? I can't remember. Uh, Bob Jack- Jane, Giacomelli, yep. uh, Didier Peroni, yep. uh, Dick Johnson. There's some big names. Charlie there, O'Brien, so. John yep. Harvey. Yeah, all these guys. Yeah. So, but it made no difference. I, I was contacted. <laughs> I was. <laughs> You know, you sort of sit at home, it must be like a movie star, you sit at home waiting for the phone to ring, ring. <laughs> the phone, the phone actually did ring, but it wasn't, it was, it was by Peter Brock's business manager, I can't remember the guy's name, and he rang me and he said, look, you know, we'd like to invest in you as a driver, and I thought, wow, you know, this is, because, you know, Brock was a big, big deal, but nothing ever happened, nothing no. happened, it was just, just lip service, so... So it turned into nothing. So, uh, so, you know, I just went back to racing open wheelers again. Yeah. Well, you eventually got your chance. 
with, as you said, the Volvo team, and I wonder how was it tough to adapt to touring cars, especially as you're coming from, I guess, you know, light, proper cars. Yeah, proper proper racing cars yeah. with big V8 engines or you know V8 engines, whereas now you're suddenly in a touring car, production-based touring car with a heavily turbocharged engine. The the cars you first drove. How was that? How was that transition? Did you feel a little bit all at sea at the beginning with, or you just get in it and drive mm. the hell out of it? Well, I did two. I did two runs in it before. This was '85, so it's my toe in the water. I'd met Mark Pitch at the Western Australia Round, and you know he 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 was running it as a privateer. It wasn't the factory back back team then, and he was Sandown's approaching, and he was looking to get someone from overseas, like Thomas Lindstrom or Brancatelli or. I don't know, there, was, there were a number of factory Volvo drivers over there then, but he didn't get anyone. I, get, I imagine he probably wouldn't pay anything, so they wouldn't come. <laughs> but anyway, last minute, I, I get a call saying, you know, I want you to drive with Robbie at Sandown. So I had a test at Oran Park, and uh, yeah, I, d- I didn't have any real drama with it, to be honest. Like, um, I, I, Mark, Mark tells this story, so it's not me telling the story, because I can't recall. But he said within five or six laps, I was as fast as Robbie. So, okay. so um, if that's the case or not, I, I didn't ever have much trouble adapting to it. But where I did have trouble adapting was was at Bathurst. So I'd never been to Bathurst. Yeah. So I went to Bathurst first day of practice. In those days, it was uh, you, you drove on the Wednesday, and I had no idea. There's no simulation games, no, no. <laughs> no PlayStation. No. I didn't even know where the track went. <laughs> So I was struggling the first day, and I and I've told this story to many people, but I, I like to tell it because it's it's uh, contrary to what people think of me. I went and saw Alan Grice and told him I was having trouble, and he said, "Look, I'll I'll give you a few tips." So he put me in his road car and drove me around the track and told me a lot of things about what to expect because he'd driven open wheelers in, yeah. in back in the day. Even though he he says it still says open wheelers are for sheilers, <laughs> which is politically incorrect now, uh, he understood what I was going through. Yep. You know, the the particular it was left hand drive. Bathurst is a very difficult track. It was a turbocharged touring car, so I had a lot of you know things to deal with. He gave me all these tips, and the next day I was faster than Robbie. So I'm for, I'll forever be grateful to Alan Grice, and he's seen and was seen as a hard man of racing, you know, and he, and he was too. I mean, I raced against him a bit. But, uh, you know, that was a really nice thing to do. I've always had a lot of time for him ever since. I've just finished reading a book about Bathurst, um, and Alan Grice comes up, as you'd expect, a few times yeah. as, a, as a dual winner. Is he, he's a bit of an underrated. He doesn't really come up in the same conversation as Richards, Brock, no, Perkins, no. but... Very, very accomplished, very, very fast driver. Very, very good driver. Very, very good I mean, driver. He went to Europe, proved himself yes, there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, he was he was truly a very, very talented driver. But he wore the black hat, you know, and I think he did that on purpose because he, you know, the whiter than white image that Brock portrayed, Christ, Christ, he did, didn't like it, you know. Yeah. And I think this is only me being an amateur psychologist, but you know, I think he played the the bad man more so and. And uh, Holden, later on, he drove for the factory team. He drove for Tom Orbitschel in the yep. HRT. Yeah. So, so he was obviously very well thought of. And, and he was a very, very, very fine driver. So, uh, you know, I mean, he was always a factor at Bathurst. Yeah. And then, in fact, uh, because of that, later on, the first year Stevie J, Stevie Johnson drove at Bathurst, I suggested to Dick that he get Gricey to co-drive with him because he was good. He was a good mentor, you know. Yeah. He was a good teacher. So... Um, and that's what he did. So, anyway, yeah, it's, it's, a nice, it's, a, it's a neat segue into another. We're well, sort of skipping forward a little bit. We'll go back and forth a little bit. But uh, you raced until you were sort of mid, 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 mid oh, early, early, steady. Okay, steady, okay. steady. I mean, no one knows how old I am. Yeah. Even my mother's confused. Yep. Um, Somewhere between. But I was certainly 40 on. Forty and. Uh, I was on the front row of the grid at Bathurst when I was fifty. Yeah. So when they talk journalists, yep. not, not you Scott of course, but certain journalists talk about Lowndes as being in his lat- latter stages of yes. his career or Jason Bright, you know, now Jason Bright's had a, a patchy few years, no question, but it's, 
today's racing in supercar land is very dependent on what you're driving. Yep. And whilst now you can go to Triple Eight Engineering or Pro Drive or any of those guys and buy the latest bits, you've still got to operate them. Yep. And and so the driver to a large degree is very dependent on his engineer where it wasn't like that when I drove. Towards the end it was to some degree, but you know, it's it's very much a little package now. So if you you might see someone that's you know the last third of the field, and you go, gee, he's no good, but he's probably only three tenths of a second off yeah. the bloke that's up the field. And, that, so, and, that, and those three tenths may not be him anyway. No, that's right. So, so, so that's why I was sort it's of very questioning. hard to choose it. It's like if you put it, uh, you know, Lewis Hamilton in a in a car like a, a Williams, he's not going to be on the front row of the grid, is he? No, no. But that's probably the, not the right analogy, but. But you know the, the the cars at the back of the field are there because they're the they're back of the field cars, even though they might have been originally built by Triple Eight. It's they they the top teams are always updating, upgrading, developing, and with the sort of science power now you can have not only with people, with engineers, and with data analysts, and with computer programs, you can do all this simulation stuff. But you've got to have the money, you've got to have the budget yeah. to do it. So it's. It's, it's, it's quite different than what it was. That's why I quite love historic racing, because you just go along and you have a talk to someone, fang around in the car, and you know, go home at night, you know, and no one says, geez, you passed it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I find that interesting in that, I mean, I grew up watching the ATCC during the 90s and everything, so there was Perkins, yourself, um, Dick Johnson, Brock, who all raced into their, you know, 40s and 50s, and yeah. didn't just race, like, competitively raced. Yes. Um, and well, we spoke about Alan Grice, Alan Grice and Wynn Percy when they won, they were both in their late 40s. And, yes, yes. Um, and it seems that, like you say now, that people will get into their, like Russell Engel seems to be almost the last of that breed that still kept racing yeah, with, well, with justification because he's... Well, he's, he's good at it. Enough. You know, he um, may not be quite as... I think the little tiny bit you lose is a qualifying speed. Yeah. But Russell's a fine race driver, but you might notice that no one picked him up this year for for Sandown Bathurst. Yep. So, you know, the perception is probably that he's he's passed it at that level. I mean, I when I stopped racing in the in the series as such, I didn't want to race in the endurance races. Now, if I'd have known how much money they were getting paid to do it, I might have changed my mind. <laughs> but but I just didn't want to. I wanted to keep racing, and I was helped to keep racing by you know people that you see. Me. Well, that's um, what I wanted to say. Like, how did you know? Because uh, I mean, that was a tough. Which was we'll, we'll, it was a tough decision, I think, to make. It was a, a tricky time, from what I've read and what yes, you've spoken yes, about yes, to other yes, people. Yes. So, how did you come to that? Because um, I mean, do you? I mean, you may, maybe maybe you have lost three tenths or half a second, but you sort of it's hard. Is, is it? Do you know that? Do you no, not understand? Really. I mean, not, how not, do you not realize really. that not you really. go? I need to sort of. No, it's time. Really. Well, I don't know. I mean, I I just thought I. I should. I was going through a very difficult period in my life. I had depression, uh, had you know relationship issues, and you know it was just. I thought oh, I should do this before I completely sink, you know, and look like an idiot. So that was part of it. The last year of my racing life, I, I could have of my racing life in supercars. I could have uh, driven for Larry Perkins because Larry and I were sort of friends, you know, not close friends, but friends. We'd had some terrific races together, uh, and he he wanted me to sort of play a mentoring role to Jack. Yeah. And I, but I'd, I'd already told Paul Crookshank that I would drive for him, and in hindsight, it was a not the right decision. I should have driven for Larry. Yeah. Because the car that Paul had was not a great car, so then you don't know whether it's you or the car or yep. or the you know you didn't have the latest spec engines. You had the sort of heads that were two evolutions behind. So. You know, so you go through this year going, you know, is it me or is it the car or, you know, so at least with Larry I would have, because Larry was a, a racer racer, you know, yeah. he was a racer's racer and he would have, whether I would have gone any good or not, I don't know, but it was a mistake. And also I had an involvement with, with Ford to some degree. I did a lot of work with FPV and, and what was used to be ProDrive Engineering. And, uh, you know, I thought that sort of loyalty was mean something but in actual fact in the motor industry as you probably know it doesn't mean a thing not a thing not a thing so it's really funny because the, I'd had a you know Ford 
had uh, loaned me a car for many, many years, which was terrific. You know, I always had the latest, you know, whether it be FPV car or, or a territory or something. And um, the day after my last race at Phillip Island, my last supercar race, where they had a big banner for me, and it was quite moving, you know. I mean, when you don't know what you're going to do next, it's quite, it's, especially if you suffer from depression. Yeah. Like, you know, you're sitting on the grid and you've bloody got tears rolling down your face. So, And then the next day, we had a ride day, a sponsor ride day at Phillip Island, and this woman from Ford Motor Company rang me up and she said, would you bring, would you bring your car back this week? And I go... I beg your pardon. She said, would you, "Would you bring your car back? You've got a territory registered numbers, and would you bring it back?" And I go, "Yeah, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do that." I'll, yeah. So, <laughs> a bit of a so you were like, it's like you clean the crumbs off the table <laughs> as soon as the, the food's finished. So anyway, I, I mean, I knew a lot of people at Ford, and several of them are still friends, you know. But and they, I bought a bought a car from them, but. But it took a few weeks to get organised, you know, so there I was, carless, carless and driverless. Anyway, uh, you know, it evolved into the Touring Car Masters, which I love. Uh, you know, sometimes I get it, the politics uh, get me, but I try to ignore it. And I love racing those old cars, you know, they've got 600 horsepower and 8 inch wheels and they're challenging and so, yeah. But wait, there's more. JB and I had so much to talk about that we've had to split this podcast in half. So check out part two where JB discusses his relationship with Dick Johnson, his battles with mental health, the future of supercars and the one car and track combo that's on his bucket list.